Hello, and welcome back to Gage Hill Crafts. I'm Sarah. And I'm Rick. And that's Leo, back there. So if he's <laughs> making a weird noise during the uh, during this episode, we apologize, but he's a little bored. Anyway, <laughs> we're here today to talk about Rick's latest homebrew recipe. So let's, uh, let's dive right in. So this beer is called Metaphors and Rainbows, whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's a Vermont-style uh, uh, IPA, uh, sometimes referred to as a New England I IPA, but um, honestly, it was invented here in Vermont, so I'm going to claim it as ours. There you go. <laughs> um, so this is a beer that I've probably been wanting to make for a very long time, and you know, we've always we've made a lot of IPAs in the past, but nothing as big and fruity and hoppy as, as this one. Um, and that's mostly because I didn't really know a lot about the techniques that were involved uh, in order to make it hazy, in order to make it the right color, in order to get more of the nose, in order to get less of the bitterness from the hops. Mm -hmm. And so I found a recipe um, by a, a brew judge, or a BJCP brew judge named Dan Paris. And he had a very good recipe that I kind of cribbed from, only to find that uh, the galaxy hops that were called for it in it uh, aren't were kind of scarce right now so okay. they were really expensive and I didn't really want to spend a lot of money it's already when the more hops you add to, to a beer the more expensive it's going to be because that's really the most expensive ingredient in any beer that you're going to make mm -hmm. so with that in mind I, I substituted everything where he had galaxy hops I substituted with citra which is a close proximity to it and um, so this is the result, and it's a pretty simple recipe as far as the grain bill is concerned, as far as the hops are concerned. Uh, it's just that there are a lot of hops involved. Right. So let's talk about um, kind of the basis for this uh, style of beer. As you mentioned, it's a Vermont IPA. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would characterize these as hop forward but not bitter. They're very fruity typically yeah. and kind of sweet. True, right. true. Yeah. Some of that sweetness comes from the yeast that I use. Some of, uh, some of it will come from the hops and the fact that most of the hops are actually added at, after the boil. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a little cribber here or to reminder is that when you add hops, the earlier you add hops in the boil, the more bitter it will be. It'll extract those bitter t uh, notes from the hops. and then, uh, But later on, you get more of the aromas from it. And that's why also you dry hop, and the dry hops will even make it more aroma forward. Mm -hmm. So in this one, we used just uh, some Magnum, and only a half ounce at it, and I put it in about the 30 minutes. Some other brews, like West Coast IPAs, they're going to be a little bit more on the bitter, drier side. Yeah. And the New England style, East Coast style, are going to be more fruity, and they're going to be a little sweeter, as you mm -hmm. said. Should we uh, go ahead and taste it and talk about it some more? <laughs> I've been diving into it. So yeah. So the... this is not a blind taste, I'll tell you that. We've done that before on the show where uh, I've really put Rick under the gun and won't let us drink beer until we taste it on camera, but we've been drinking this yeah. out of the can for about a week. Um, but... Well, we wanted to have it ready for our guests at our our Thanksgiving dinner. Right. Um, and so that was kind of why mm -hmm. we didn't get a chance to record this video before that. Right. So, so cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. So the first thing you're going to notice is that cloudy haze. Mm -hmm. um, and through it. <laughs> right, exactly. And the orange, really lovely orange golden color that comes from it. Mm -hmm. Nice head on it. Yeah, especially since it's been sitting a little bit in front of us while we dealt with the dog cutting up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you got, I get notes of like oranges yeah. and a little bit of grapefruit. Yeah, definitely a citrusy head. Or a citrusy, yeah, uh, sorry, aroma. It's a nice lacing on there, too. And citrus in the first mm. taste, for sure. Yeah. But nice just, carbonation, very even. Notice you get kind of the grapefruit, kind of pithy bitterness of the grapefruit. A little bit, yeah. After it kind of fades, mm -hmm. but not a bitterness that you associate with more of a hops or like not that astringent kind of bitterness or piney resin. Right. Or what I say is like herbal earthy too. True. Um, it's a brighter bitterness. And I would say in general, the style is really nice. If you think you don't like hop forward beers, try a Vermont or a New England style IPA because they are going to be sweeter and they're going to be more of that citrus flavor and less of that deeper herbal kind of taste. It's often described, the West Coast IPAs are often described as being resiny or uh, they borrow terms from the cannabis industry and say it's dank. 
Mm -hmm. um, this is going to be a lot sweeter, a lot fruitier, mm -hmm. and, and I'm pretty pleased. And a little bit smoother aftertaste. Thanks. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, a smoother mouthfeel. Nice. Now, the smoothness mm -hmm. in the mouthfeel mm -hmm. comes because um, in addition, uh, well, let me talk a bit about how you get that haziness. One is it has a pound of uh, flaked oats in it. So you're going to get that haziness because of the flaked oats. And the other is that I only recently learned is that the, the dry hops are done during the primary fermentation. Oftentimes you'll get instructions to dry hop about a week after the beer has been put into the primary fermentation. By then the yeast has done most of the original work and most people will then rack it to another vessel. By adding it to the primary, and this was only done three days into, that apparently adds some of the, the cloudiness and the haziness. Okay, so some of the, um, I guess, proteins and other um, components of the hop, um, the physical qualities of the hops get broken down by the yeast and that ends up in the beer. That's kind of what you're saying. Uh, I, yeah, I assume I guess, as much. I'm yeah. not going to, I'm not going to pretend to know the science mm -hmm. behind all these things. Okay. It's just what I've read. And mm -hmm. in this particular article, which will be linked in the blog post that's associated with this video, uh, we'll have that. And it's a very good instruction. Uh, it's again, it's from a BJCP judge and what he does in his recipe is instruct people on how to taste for New England IPAs, Vermont IPAs, mm -hmm. when they're judging. Mm -hmm. It's actually, I think it's specialty IPA, or specialty uh, section. I'm not exactly sure. Right. I'm not sure this has um, been around long enough to get its own class. And not every um, kind of uh, trendy beer style ends up getting its own class in the BJCP mm -hmm. guide. Sometimes things come and go so quickly that, you know, they don't bother um, renovating their or, or revising their guidelines just yeah. for something that might be you know, on trend for a year or a year and a half and then go away. But For example, the milkshake beer that we did right. or the very popular about 10 years ago was the India Black Ale or the Black IPA, which mm -hmm. makes me twitch. Um, but yeah, those are exactly so. Just because something has been new or like Brute IPAs, just because mm -hmm. something is new and trendy doesn't mean it automatically gets added to a section of the, uh, the BJCP uh, style guides. Right. I liken it to, uh, I'm, I'm giggling to myself because I liken it to dog show competitions. People will come up with these funny crossbreeds, you know, like Labradoodles or whatever. The, the American Kennel Club does not recognize those. <laughs> um, so I think it's kind of similar with the, the beer judging. Sorry, I just have to say cockapoo. <laughs> All right, so back to the recipe. <laughs> All right, so I hinted um, that it's a pretty simple, straightforward recipe. Yes, yes. Um, it splits the pale, uh, the pale malts into two row, which is an American uh, two row, as well as a UK Maris Otter. Uh, so you have that is makes up a majority of the grain bill. It's about eleven pounds in this five gallon batch. Then it's a pound of flaked oats, and then I put a pound of a honey malt. Uh, mm -hmm. Canadian honey malt, and again, that'll help add to some of the sweetness that it comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. And then the hops, um, it's just half an ounce of Magnum in the 30 minutes, a little bit of citra, a little bit of Amarillo just before flame out, and then and during what's called the Whirlpool uh, timing, which is when you bring the uh, wort down to about 168 degrees, then you swirl it in the pot or in the kettle and then you add your hops then and that mm -hmm. helps release some of those, those aromas and the oils. Right. So the water's warm but not as hot as it would be if you exactly. were boiling. Exactly. So it releases or has different attributes because of that temperature. Mm -hmm. And then uh, again at three days and the primary then a ton of hops are added. I think in this case, let me check my notes, uh, roughly six ounces I'm sorry, four ounces of uh, hops. In this case, mine was mostly citra and then a little bit of Amarillo. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. yep. And then it took, what, another three or four days to finish fermenting? Well, the timing Before of this was it. interesting because, again, I'm brewing in the basement. We're here in Vermont. It's quite cold. So in order to make sure you get your the temperatures that your yeast need in order to uh, ferment, uh, you normally would want that to be consistently around 68 degrees, 65 degrees, and the basement is not that. So I had a very long, very uh, vigorous uh, primary fermentation, uh, but after about a week, I moved it upstairs to it was a little bit warmer in our house. Mm -hmm. And also, I wanted to keep it 
uh, in, I'm using a catalyst, a craft brews catalyst system, which has a way of dumping the trub. And because there are so many hops in this, I wanted to, you want to get them off of that uh, hop. So they drop down into a mason jar, which can then be removed without losing anything, dumped, put that back in, you let that settle again, and mm -hmm. then repeat. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I got as much of the trub out before we ended up putting it in the keg. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that kind of mimics a, a professional system. I think we've talked about this catalyst system a little yeah. bit here on the channel before, but that essentially um, mimics what professional brewers use, which are those large stainless steel tanks that have the cone at the bottom. And so you can get rid of all the um, sediment and spent yeast and spent hops yeah, exactly. without disturbing the mm -hmm. rest of the beer, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, introducing oxygen, right? That's another thing that's mm -hmm. nice about yeah. this system because you can close the butterfly valve and then remove this, you're not opening up and introducing any more oxygen to the system. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You're not, the, the, the less you handle the beer during the process, the better. Mm -hmm. um, it also, it just reduces the chance for infection or introducing any kind of unwanted flavors. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And then we put it on our keg system. Um, and it, just as a reminder, we have a two tap keg system that's piped from the basement up to the kitchen. Um, and we use, uh, just a standard CO2 canister, a short one um, that home brewers often use. Um, anything else special about our, our kegging system? Well, I wanted to use this opportunity to give a shout out to our friend Neil Fitzgerald, who kind of oh, yes. saved the day. So I had kegged the beer and then uh, got it under pressure to do what's called a forced carbonation, which is uh, highly pressuring. I think it's like 25, 30 PSI. And then you let the um, the keg get cold so it'll absorb more of the CO2. And then I promptly ran out of CO2. <laughs> and so I uh, sent an email or a text to Neil and said, hey, any chance you have a, an extra CO2 canister you can spare? And he's, uh, he's great. So he did, went over there. Uh, thanks to Neil, I was able to carbonate the beer and get it under pressure uh, long enough for me to go get more canisters of CO2 and then be able to have it ready to serve in time for our Thanksgiving guests. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, So that's uh, about it. There's not much uh, fancy about the CO2 or about it. It just, uh, once it was under pressure and once it, the beard had a chance to absorb all the CO2, I just reduced it to about 10 PSI and we've been enjoying it ever since. Mm -hmm. Now, the big problem is making sure we don't enjoy all of it uh, <laughs> because we do have our annual Boxing Day party coming up and I'd like right. to be able to show off because I'm really proud of this beer. It's excellent. It is excellent. And I will say, um, you know, Rick's attempted a couple of sh um, more hoppy IPAs mm -hmm. and they've been good. Um, but I think this one really kind of cracked it. Um, the goofy name we should talk about. <laughs> um, we, uh, we are fans of Burlington Beer Company's beers in particular and um, other, other Vermont breweries. I think a lot of people are coming up with these you know, big IPAs. And in, in many regards, there's some similarities between them. You know, everybody kind of has their version of the style or multiple versions of the style. And I think people run out of ideas for what to name them. So you get really off the wall things. There's something with like the word wizard in it. I've seen like unicorn something, this, that, and the other thing, beer. And so uh, we were sort of just joking around about this one evening and came, came up with um, metaphors and rainbows, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's similar to what happens in the kind of the knitting world as well. Oh, sure. When you're coming up with names for your patterns mm -hmm. and, you know, you have to, especially if you're going to publish it, you need to make sure that you don't step on somebody else's toes and do something that something's already been similarly named or exactly named. And mm -hmm. so we were just silly until recently. I was just calling it Citra Amarillo IPA. And Sarah reminded me that we had decided the next time we did a big IPA, mm -hmm. we were going to call it Unicorns and, and unicorns and rainbows, whatever. Was it the other way around? No, metaphors. And metaphors, rainbows. yeah, yeah. Unicorns <laughs> is what the other one we had. Used. That's right. There was yes. another one. I think it was unicorns that prompted us to uh -huh. do the metaphors or something. Yes, yes. So anyway, it's uh, it's just fun to, to name it uh, after that. <laughs> right. And I mean, we're not a commercial brewery, um, so you know, it doesn't really matter what we call our beers. But again, um, it's, well, we, it's funny to keep your eye on the brewing industry and see to see what's happening with both styles and naming conventions and packaging and marketing, you know, it's just, it's just sort of funny to watch. Well, to some extent it does matter because, uh, and included also in the blog post that will accompany this video is a link to the brewer's friend page where I publish, uh, 
my publish my recipes and they're not published until I finish them and I know that they're okay in which case I share them and then people can find them by style etc mm -hmm. so um, so in order to do that you know I give it a name so that it stands out as well right yeah so um, we do encourage you to try this style um, I would say it's maybe a little bit more pricey than your average like pale ale or something like that but we've done the math and you know these bigger Vermont IPAs, especially the kind of um, na head headliner uh, beers, I guess you'd call them your heady toppers, your sip of sunshines, things like that, um, you know, they're going to run you $17, $18 for a four pack of these beers. So they're, um, they're an investment. Um, and so if you want to get that experience and want to be able to enjoy it more or share it more um, at home, I think, you know, as always, home brewing is the way to go. Yeah. Yeah, again, as Sarah pointed out, the more hops, or I said earlier, the more hops you put in it, the more expensive the beer is going to be. And again, the higher alcohol, uh, both the examples that you gave, Hetty Topper and Sip of Sunshine, both clock mm -hmm. in at 8% mm -hmm. ABV. Once you get above that 6, 5.9, 6% 6 range, they, uh, the taxes kind of go up or the price goes up as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, even, but even with all the hops and even without using, you know, even if I had used the galaxy, which are significantly more expensive right now, it would have still been significantly less per 16 ounce pour. Right. I say we, you know, any home brew comparatively of any style, you're going to be paying about 20 cents on the dollar to brew it yourself. So it's a significant, mm -hmm. significant savings. Yeah. And it's fun. It is fun, you you know, and you don't need, well, and you don't need a ton of fancy equipment. Um, you know, you can, you can do it in an instant pot. You can do it with just a bucket and a, um, a kettle to boil your, your stuff in. So mm -hmm. you don't need a keg system. You don't need all these things. Yeah. Um, just save all your empties from the beers you do like. And that's another challenge that's coming up more and more as more and more brewers, especially independent brewers, move to cans, mm -hmm. um, which is great for them. And it's also nice because cans are a lot better than they used to be in the past. Uh, but they make it significantly less expensive for the brewers themselves because uh, they don't have to worry about breakage, etc. Mm -hmm. So Transportation, weight, yeah. fuel costs, all that stuff, it all adds up. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And so a lot of these groups are able to just get their own canning systems and just make their own cans and be able to mm -hmm. independently distribute. You'll just see these silver cans with a, a sticky label on yeah. them. And that's even available to home brewers if they want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, you know, save your, save at least two cases of um, bottles mm -hmm. and just keep reusing those and you're good. Yep. And you can also buy um, empties from home, home brew shops too sure. if you don't, you know. If you don't drink very much out of the out of glass bottles yourself, um, anything else about brewing in general? Oh, we we're going to talk about your new wort chiller. Uh, oh right, that you yeah. Got. Um, right. So uh, Sarah gifted me as an anniversary gift. Thank you, honey. You're um, <laughs> a it's called a it's I think it's made by Cuss Brewing, uh, and there'll be a link in the blog post as well. Uh, and it's called a tri coil. So a, a traditional immersion or uh, immersible wort chiller is made out of copper, and it's usually just a single coil um, that's just welded together or clamped together. And, you know, those are perfectly fine, but they found a way to essentially split off using some couplers, three separate coils of copper, which adds more surface area, which means that we are able to bring the beer down to uh, temperatures both for whirlpool and for pitching yeast much faster. Mm -hmm. And it makes it a lot better beer the faster you can get those down. But it also allows us here on a well system and just always being conscientious of you know, not over overusing any of our, our uh, resources, it allows us to use less water as well. Mm -hmm. For the chilling system. So yeah. yeah, I think that was a very worthwhile investment um, when you mentioned to me that you were able to knock down the temperature from you know, boiling point of uh, 212 down to what? 168, 168 and just under a minute or mm -hmm. something with less than a gallon of water. Yeah. Um, so that's great. And I'll continue to try and find other ways to reduce the amount of water that we use in the mm -hmm. process. Yeah. So we'll link to that. And again, we're not sponsored by anything. No. Um, we, would, we wouldn't mind. Um, <laughs> but, but we're not. So any of these products that we mentioned, we will link to just because we find them useful. But um, not because we're yeah. in any way affiliated with these companies. So yeah. We buy everything ourselves. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, but we want to share knowledge because you know we're learning too, um, and 
we just like to share, you know, what works for us, things that we found that have been helpful. So. Yeah, there's a wealth of information out there, and I never claim to be a professional or an expert on this, but I do like sharing the things I learn because there, you know, you just you just may not be able to find that somewhere else sometimes. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, or there's information overwhelm. You know, you go through, you do your research, you find five conflicting opinions on any one aspect of, of these different hobbies, um, and... So you have to kind of try them out. So we just want to report back and say, you know, yes, this did work or that didn't work um, in our case. Yeah, it's yeah. very similar to knitting. I was going to say is if we, mm -hmm. uh, we've in the past, there has encouraged people that if you're not, if you haven't already participating in a knitting group, um, that is similar, you, you can start one. It's the same thing with the homebrew club. If you don't, mm -hmm. there's so much information out there, but nothing's better than the hands-on information that your friends may have. Yeah. So, you know, whether it's you're learning a particular style of knitting or a process or learning how to do a process of brewing, it's great to rely on your local friends and the purveyors. So whether it's a, um, a knitting shop or mm -hmm. a homebrew shop, mm -hmm. that's probably better than just going down the rabbit hole of all the information on the Internet, which may or may not be correct. Right. Exactly. Even here. <laughs> yeah, right. Your mileage may vary. But again, we want to share what works for us. So. Exactly. Good. Well, um. I think that's it for this episode. Happy brewing, everybody. I do hope that um, even if you're not a home brewer yourself, that you enjoy these episodes where we talk about beer more in depth, how they're made, um, what the components are, so that you can um, at least taste commercial beers, learn about different styles, and figure out what you like to drink. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so cheers once again, and uh, happy home brewing, happy beering, and happy holidays, because um, we're coming up on the holidays. So we'll see you again next week. Take care. Thanks. Hello and welcome back to Gay Show Cross. Don't ever, sorry. I was making, I was making a face. <laughs> oh. <laughs> What's the dog doing? <laughs> I'm good at guitar. He's going crazy. <laughs> Where'd it go? Where'd it go? I'm watching, waiting for the tree to fall. <laughs> no, 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 no. Welcome back to Hi, welcome to Jim Grabs. Oops, sorry.